When I was growing up, I figured I was a bad kid because my parents yelled at me a lot. I listened to too much rock and roll, I watched too much television, and I almost never did any homework. But from early on, I had a sanctuary. Her name was Flossie. Flossie was my refuge from my parents' anger. When I was little and upset, I would run into her room off the kitchen and she'd calm me down. She'd tell me that just because my parents yelled at me, it didn't mean they didn't love me. Flossie became my best friend. My mother hired Flossie when I was two. In the 1950s in New York City, it was almost a cliche for a middle-class white family to have an African-American maid. Flossie was from Atlanta, Georgia. She came to work five days a week. I was nine years old when one afternoon I went into Flossie's room while she was reading the New York Post. She sat me down and pointed to a picture of Joe Lewis, whom she said was the greatest boxer of all time. She told me everything about him. He was called the Brown Bomber. I said, I also want to be called the Brown Bomber. Flossie wouldn't hear of it. She said there was only one brown bomber, and that was that. Flossie used to secretly take me to 125th Street in Harlem. She was proud of me. Her friends made a fuss over me, and I loved it. One morning, when I was 10, I walked into Flossie's room, and as usual, she was reading the New York Post. When she didn't look up, for some crazy reason, I took down my pants and exposed myself. <laughs> I said, Flossie, look! She took one glance and he immediately covered her eyes with the newspaper. Child, put that little piece of skin away. <laughs> I'm a lady. You don't do that to a lady. I pulled up my pants and ran back to my room. Something clicked. I realized there were limits. <laughs> I was 14 and I had been stealing change from my parents for about a year. They never seemed to notice. Flossie often left a red pocketbook in the kitchen. One morning when she was cleaning my parents' bedroom, I quietly made my way into the kitchen and nervously opened it. I undid the clasp of her wallet. Inside, I found four $1 bills. I took one. For a moment, I felt triumphant. When I got back to my room, I began to feel guilty. I never felt that way when I stole from my parents. Later that day, I heard Flossie talking to herself. I had four dollars and now I have three. A dollar is missing. Over and over, she said it, a dollar is missing. I knew I had to put it back. I died a thousand deaths as I waited for the right moment. When it came, I snuck back into the kitchen and returned the dollar. Sometime later, I heard Flossie's voice again. I must have made a mistake. Flossie never said another word about it. I loved her for that. I left for college at 17. When I said goodbye to Flossie, we hugged and both of us cried. She said, Leonard, remember, most of all, be kind. My first job after graduate school was teaching at a high school in New York City. One day I decided to surprise Flossie with one of my students' science projects, a live, multicolored, four-foot-long snake. When Flossie saw it, she ran out of the room screaming. I went after her to apologize. She tearfully re revealed that when she was a girl in Atlanta, a gang of white boys made her bite the heads off snakes and lizards. That was the first time I learned anything about Flossie's painful past. When I was 26, I moved to Los Angeles. On a return visit, Flossie was not there. When I asked my mother about her, she said that Flossie had become lazy and she fired her. I felt an overwhelming sickness in my stomach. I insisted that she tell me where she was. My mother said she didn't know and that was that. Hurt and confused, I went back to California. I thought about Flossie often, but to my shame, I never did anything. It was two years before I demanded that my mother give me the names of anyone who might have hired Flossie. After several weeks, I was finally able to track her down. She had moved to Flint, Michigan to live with her sister-in-law, Ethel Willis. I called and introduced myself. She said Flossie spoke about me. Recently, Flossie had a stroke and was now paralyzed on the left side of her body. She was in the Clara Barton nursing home. It was a cold November day when I stepped off the plane in Flint, Michigan. I rented a car and met Ethel Willis in front of the home. 
I think I was the only white person there. Flossie was alone in her room. She looked at me, and I looked at her. Even though she was in bed, propped up on pillows, to me she was still powerful, still majestic. I walked over and kissed her on the cheek. I sat down on the edge of her bed and took her hand in mine. We started to cry. All we could do was cry. No talking, just tears. After a while, she spoke. Leonard, I don't know why your mother fired me. I worked hard. I know you did, Flossie. My mother was wrong, I said. Flossie squeezed my hand. Leonard, you were always my heart. I gave Flossie several gifts, a box of fancy chocolates, a pink robe from Bloomingdale's, several recent copies of the New York Post. She was very happy. When I arrived at Flossie's room the next day, there was a commotion. It turns out that after I left, Flossie fell asleep and someone stole some of the chocolates. When she awoke, she was very upset. She took a metal fork from her breakfast tray and hid it under the sheets. Then she pretended to be asleep. A few minutes later, an orderly came in to steal more chocolates. Flossie forked them in the hand. She told everyone that Leonard had given those chocolates to her and to no one else. To smooth things over, I had to buy 10 boxes of chocolates for the staff and an extra box for Flossie. I stayed in Flint for a week and visited Flossie every day. Her community embraced me. Her pastor asked me to speak at his church. I was known as the white boy who didn't forget his Flossie. I had always heard about unconditional love, but I never experienced it. Sitting with Flossie and holding her hand in the Clara Barton nursing home in Flint, Michigan, I finally did. Every kid needs a champion, few have them. I was lucky to have had Flossie as mine. I had to return to California and I told Flossie I would be back to visit as soon as I could. But shortly thereafter, I got a call from the nursing home. Flossie had passed away sleep peacefully in her sleep. I never got to say goodbye. Goodbye, Flossie. I love you. Thank you.